You need to take note of that because we're going to touch on that here in just a moment. He abides in us. The Spirit bears witness. Amen? The second thing is, he says, is the water. What do you think that is? Baptism. Water baptism. That's whenever we, as, as a believer, as a, a new convert, one who puts our faith in Jesus, and Jesus allows an, a, a, a person of faith who has already come to faith to, to baptize us in water. Listen, it's, at that moment, we're not saved. We're already saved when that happens. But the beautiful thing is, is we're physically testifying, giving witness of what already has taken place by the Spirit. Come on. And this is what happens. All of a sudden, there's the immersion. We come, are y'all seeing this? And we're born again. We're buried in his death and we're res- resurrected in newness of life in his resurrection. And then the third thing is this, is the blood of Christ. Come on, somebody. The cross. The cross of Christ. The shedding of his blood. The sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? And here's the thing, but it goes on and says that these three bear witness But the next part is when you look down in verse 9, I believe it's actually in verse 10, it says, he who believes in the Son of God has the what? Witness, where? In himself. Now let me put a pause there because I'm coming back to that in the message, but I want you to catch this this morning. In your life as a believer, it is crucial, it is crucial that in our worship, in our daily life, in our daily devotion, that not only do we glorify the Father, that's who we've been reconciled to as believers, amen? But it's vital that we honor and recognize the Son. Come on, somebody. And actually, that's really easy for us. That one's pretty easier than the Father for most of us because we see him as a person, God. Are y'all with me this morning? But come on, he's all one. But it's vital that we recognize and that we glorify the triune God and recognize how he makes himself manifest in our lives as father, as son, but here's the one we tend to neglect, the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing, out of it, he's the very one that Jesus said, hey, listen, I'm going to be with the father, but I'm going to leave. God is going to come now and manifest himself in you, not just alongside you. Come on, somebody. But now in your life. I just want to encourage you this morning. You may not fully understand. Uh, you, may not, you may still be trying to wrap your head around salvation. But even at that, if you have been saved, friend, I want to encourage you. Begin to dive into the scripture and say, God, what do you say about your Holy Spirit? And here's the beautiful thing is that as you begin to look at, you begin to understand that God is the one that, that because of that, that what, he, what he did through his son, he has saved us through his son, Jesus. Amen? He paved the way through his son for redemption. Jesus demonstrated God's love for us. Scripture says when, when we're still sinners, when we're furthest away from. But listen, the Holy Spirit is the one who Jesus has released and imparted into us to empower us to live the overcoming life. And I just want to encourage you. Man, if you haven't asked Jesus to baptize you in the, in the Holy Spirit, man, to fill your life, to overflow, to be able to live the victorious life, Friend, I want to encourage you, begin to ask Jesus. Don't wait for an altar call. Listen, if you're looking for salvation, don't wait for an altar call. Give your life to Jesus today, right now. We don't have a clue. Listen, we're living in 2020. Every day is a new surprise. Amen? Amen? We don't know what tomorrow nor during the next hour will bring us. Listen, if any day you're going to surrender your life to Jesus, today is the day. Believer, if any day is the day that you're going to grow closer and be empowered by the Holy Spirit, well, Pastor, I thought I gave my salvation. You did. As salvation, he came and he resided. You got all three. But there's a distinct difference between receiving the Holy Spirit at salvation and being baptized, being immersed with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's a yielding, completely saying every single thing. And the difference is this, being full and you being immersed completely in the Holy Spirit with overflow. I'm trying to give you all the illustration of a glass and a jug kind of thing. That's, it'd help if I had it. But I just want to encourage you. In your worship, in your worship, man, every day you should say, Holy Spirit, baptize. Jesus, baptize me in your Holy Spirit today. A fresh and new. You know, the beauty is this. 
That's, that's the baptism that can happen over and 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 again. Amen? So why not want it more and more and more? Amen? Amen? Come on, somebody. If you've got your Bible, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning. And I think I'm going to begin to bring, bring if, if you will, this series. I've just been kind of praying that... Pastor Nancy has been asking me, saying, Pastor Nancy, if you kind of give me a heads up, I could really build your kind of the thematics and everything for the, the, and I told her, I said, I'm just praying and I'm reading and asking the Lord what to say each week, and that's where I'm just trying to be obedient. And uh, I feel like we're fixing transition, but today I'm going to do this and we'll see what happens next week. So we're just making it happen on that. But today I want to pick up, we're going to look at the next part of 1 Peter and I want to come back to First John just a moment to tie it in at the end and kind of show you how this works together. But I want you to keep in mind this word, witness. Everybody say witness. Here's the thing. We've been talking about the living God. And out of this, we've talked about several things about man, how he's a God, he's living, and he is the only living God. He's living, he's breathing. He's a God who's alive and well, amen? We don't serve a dead God. We serve a resurrected king. And because of that, Scripture tells us because he lives, we too can live. How this last week we talked about what happens when we serve a living God. And as we, through Jesus, receive him as Lord and Savior of our life. First, Peter writes to the dispersed Jews, devout Jews. And he tell, I mean, uh, new converts, the new believers. He tells them, he says, listen, you now have a living hope. Because you put your faith in Jesus, because of what he's done, every day you have a hope that's living, that's breathing. It's not something that fades away. It doesn't pass away. It is eternal. Everybody say eternal. And he goes on and says, not only do you have a living hope, not only do you have a faith, he says, but because of this, you've got a joy unexpressed. He said, man, you're full of joy and life because you're serving who? A living God. And the outcome of your life begins to change. And last week we talked about the wonder of it. And we talked about the standard that all of a sudden our life no longer is given to our formal youthful lust and the ways that we live before Jesus. But now that we've received Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to refine us. Romans says that our minds are being renewed by the word of God. Come on, somebody. And out of that, we're continually, daily sacrificing, laying down flesh and carnal out and saying, God, I want all of you. Fill me with your spirit that I can live this overcoming life. He goes on, not only do we talk about the standard, but we talked about the value. What it costs to receive this eternal life, this eternal hope. Here's the beautiful thing. It was paid in full by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But there's a call and demand in our life that we would be holy, that we would strive to say, Jesus, my model, my example is you. And listen, not that we become legalistic and works-based, but that we surrender our lives completely and walk in the grace of Almighty God, yielded to his authority. Listen, if you're still living, I want you to take this, and this is going to be tweeted this morning. You, somebody needs to tweet this out. If you're still living by your standards, you're not saved. Come on. If there has not been a change in your life, you may want to revisit your encounter with Jesus because Jesus demands change. Come on, somebody. When the Holy Spirit begins to move, because you remember what I said, when you receive Jesus, you receive God, Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit does not take habitat in an uncleaned home. Come on. Once he takes habitat, he refines. He, when he shows up, he purifies. He takes it and he goes through and begins to work. Now listen, salvation is instant. But listen, sanctification is a process. That's the reason why you should be seeing change. Come on. Things should change. A pastor, well, man, I'm still struggling. That's all right. But are we seeing change? Are you feeling, are you sensing the work in the Holy Spirit transforming you from the inside out? Come on. And he works this. But here's the deal. Peter goes through, and even Peter, Paul, listen, if you go through and look at any of the gospel, actually 
any of the writings of Peter, Paul, if you look at John, they all deal with this on a regular basis. And they deal with the issue of people, of the believers not losing their faith, them not losing the track of what the Holy Spirit's doing in their life, and them remaining steadfast to the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, and their life accountable before God, and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit with the end. Come on. Now listen, I want to tell you something. You on your own cannot clean up your life. You on your life cannot change your life. You on your own. That's where you need the Holy Spirit. And as we yield to Him, as we surrender to Him, listen, He begins to work. He doesn't just go through and just all of a sudden say, you know what, you better get all this right before I do it. No, He goes, let's begin to work on you. Let's begin to grow you. Do you realize that today there are still things in my life, after all my years of serving the Lord, I'm st- God, the Holy Spirit's still working on me. He's still working on me. To make me what I ought to. I don't know. I think I'm doing that because of old VBS days. <laughs> Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. Oh, how patient he must be because he's still working on you and me. Amen? He's working on us. And this is why, I want you to catch this this morning, because we're called in this earth to be the living, we serve the living God, to be the living witness of the living God. And I want you to write this down. This is the main point today. Because the living God lives in me. He lives in you. I want you to think about that this morning. Oftentimes when we think about the word witness, we tend, I believe this is what happens. I believe that whenever I kind of take assessment of believers and the struggles that we have, I often, I I think our problem is, is that when we see witness in scripture or even testimony, we look at it like this. Yeah, officer, I saw the wreck. Yeah, that guy pulled out from that side street and sideswiped that lady. You understand the problem with that perspective? I had no skin in the game. I was a bystander looking but it doesn't affect me. Where in Scripture, when it talks about a witness, it's speaking from a first-hand experience. You were in the car. It affects you. And so out of this, when Peter's writing, he's automatically assuming that you understand and that the believers understood that, man, this witness, this position of faith, and this what you're talking about and what you're living is first-hand experience. You have received Jesus. Heaven and earth had that moment of, of that paradigm moment when they clicked together in your life and the supernatural overtook the natural and you were radically changed and transformation, metamorphosis began to take place. We call it sanctification. Come on, somebody. Regeneration began to happen in your life. You say yes to Jesus you were redeemed in that moment. You were, at that moment, the, 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 the curse of sin's broken for your life. You no longer are, are a slave to sin, but you're new and alive in King Jesus. And at that moment, transformation begins. And out of that, here's the calling, is that out of our life, that we begin to share our testimony, our account of what not took place, my life, in you, but what's taking place in me. You know one of the most powerful stories we tell this in our Grow Tracks, which just a little side note, Grow Tracks, if you've been in our church recently and you're saying, what's my next step? How can I get involved? How can I join the church? How can I serve? Take Grow Tracks. They start this Wednesday night at seven o'clock. It's a four week session. And so come be a part of that. I'm teaching it. And so we'd love to see you this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. It'll be, I believe, in this room over here at 300. But this is what I want to say. Listen, in our growth church, this is what we teach you. Is that the greatest message that you can ever give to, whenever it comes to people is the story of the cross of salvation, but not just word for word scripturally, but how has that impacted your life? We could shake our fingers all day long and tell people they're dying going to hell. But listen... It's not a reality to them until two things take place. Until the whole, until they open their ears and their eyes and their, their, to the Holy Spirit's drawing. He's always drawing. And two, 
there's a point of how God uses you as a witness and your testimony for them to go, wow, that, that must be real because it happened in a real person. So when we begin to share the power of the gospel, the power of the cross, and what Jesus has done for us, and we begin to live this out, empowered, anointed by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, listen, that's life transforming. But it demands some things in our life. It demands some place where we are constantly at this place of yielding ourselves before God. Listen, can I tell you something? If you practice constant surrender, Cleansing will automatically take care of itself. If you fill yourself with the word of God and you give room for the Holy Spirit, he will remove what doesn't belong. Come on. If you try to do it, you'll see it just come back again. When you get frustrated, you'll start cussing again. You go out play a little golf, you get a little heated out here in Texas heat, you'll begin to see that old demon rise back up in you. Come on, somebody. Just wait, your husband not fix something that you've been asking him for weeks on end. Next thing you know, I'm not gonna touch that this morning. So I just wanna encourage you, listen to me. It'll rise back up, but listen, if the Holy Spirit purges and works that and you surrender, I wanna tell you something. Then you're walking in the grace of God, the marvelous work of God that he does on life. And it's no longer works base, but listen, it's the power of the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Come on who renews us, who refines us, who, come on, are y'all with me this morning? So I want you to look at this. Three things I want to give you as Peter begins to write. Three things that he points out that are allowed to help us to maintain our witness. Mind you, remember, this isn't our account of something, but it's happened in us and through us. It's a personal account. How do we maintain that, Pastor? Well, number one, if you're taking notes, you've got to admit your wrongs. You've got to admit that in your life that you messed up. That's how we come to salvation. We repent of our sins. We acknowledge our way is wrong. His way is right. Our way leads to death. His way leads to eternal life. And so we get on track with Jesus and our surrender and saying, yes, I'm his Lord. It's saying this, Jesus, listen, when you say Lord, you're saying, Jesus, I yield. I surrender everything on my own strength on my own feet i fail brings destruction but i surrender to you as lord so you lead me you guide me come on and out of this position in this posture i want you to tell you something i can't fight very good on my knees i'm not going to move very i'm not going to be agile i'm not going to move very far but you know what in this position it demands the leading and the work of the spirit I can run my mouth, but it's interesting because Jesus tells us that we need to tame our tongue through James, right? So that too, I've got to surrender. Learn to be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to respond. God, I'm waiting on you. When he speaks, we speak. When he says move, (laughs) we move. Are you with me this morning? Out of this place, Peter begins to instruct them. He says, listen, this place is a call. You saw this in Acts, uh, chapter 2 and ch- uh, chapter, two, chapter 3, whenever he begins to give his, uh, the testimony and he begins to preach. He tells them what? Repent of your sins and turn to God. We yield and we admit our wrong. But listen, not just at salvation. If we're going to maintain this, this witness of what we've encountered, it demands, listen, That our life is a constant place of surrender. And when we're wrong, we admit it. All the wives in the house said to the husbands, (laughs) listen to him, right? It's a place of admitting. And listen, not just a physical, but spiritually. And listen, how that it reveals a a humble heart, a heart and a life submitted to God as Lord. Whenever we stumble, when we falter, that place where we come before him and say, Lord, man, I failed. I messed up. And you know what the beauty is? He's not a God who sits and thumps you on the head and says, see, I knew that you were going to fail. He doesn't sit there and, re- no. He sits there as the father who stands on the front porch waiting to come, for home, come home. And he just affirms you once again, I love you. I'm proud of you. Man, just content. Listen, he encourages, he lifts up. And he says, listen, my grace is sufficient. Amen? And out of that place of humility, 
it continues to be a place where we can maintain a place of being that, be that witness. Look at this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. And Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Is it important that we confess our sins? Yes. Is it vital that we live a repentant life? Yes. Come on, somebody. Romans, we know this. If we confess our mouth, and Peter, as he said, man, to repent, to turn from your sins, but then to acknowledge and confession, exaltation of who Jesus is rightfully in, in, in his place in our life as Lord. Listen, to confess him as Lord means that we renounce or that we repent or that we renounce our position of rightness and as lordship of our not life. No man can serve two masters. You can only serve one or the other. And whenever we confess Jesus as Lord, we're making our decision. We're saying it's no longer about me, but Jesus, I confess you. I repent of what I was, because I was a man who was an enemy of God, who was wicked, but I look to you who is righteous, who redeems me and set me free from the curse of sin and death. Amen? James chapter five, verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. How do we find healing in our life? How do we find restoration in our life? Listen, it demands a level of transparency. It demands a place of where we're willing to admit our wrongdoings, where we come before them and say, man, listen, I failed. Y'all look at me. I am one who has failed in my life. I have apologized a lot sincerely in my life. Many tears have been shed. A lot of, y'all know what I'm talking about. Kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's been, that, and you know what? Every single time, this is what I find. Healing. Healing. Every single time. And not just for me, but for those who I've offended. For those who I've, who I, who I've hurt. You know what happens? begins the process for restoration. It begins the kingdom business. Come on, somebody. He says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So we live in a place where if we're going to maintain this witness, this place where Jesus is exalted through our life. Listen, it's a place of humility where we admit our wrongs, but not only that, but we ask for wisdom also. See, oftentimes in our life, this is what our question is when it comes to things in life. We say stuff like this, what, what could be wrong? Is there anything wrong with this? Is there, well, surely there's nothing wrong with this. And this is what happens is when we begin to ask that kind of question, what happens is it begins to position us in a place to where we begin to justify our actions. There's something different whenever our perspective in asking the between right and wrong is when we begin to ask questions like, what's the wise thing to do here? Your friends ask you to go out to the honky-tonk for the weekend or whatever you want to call it. Go to the casinos and, hey, let's go. Well, there's, no, there's nothing wrong to go to the casino. They got good, what, what do they have? The, the buffet lines or what? They, they got good buffet. They got a lot of food. There's nothing wrong. And so your place is in our question is, well, what's wrong with that? All of a sudden, we begin to justify, and here's the danger, is it just begins to take a place of begin to build an action upon action upon action. The next thing we know, we find ourselves at a slippery slope. No matter what sin it leads us to. Come on, somebody. Versus, if we begin to ask the question in a place where we begin to ask the Holy Spirit, who is wisdom, say, what's the wise thing? I'll tell you a quick story. Whenever I was youth pastor, whenever I was not a youth pastor, when I was a youth, I was in high school. Just turned 16, starting to drive, and my, my, one of my best friends said, hey, Nathan, uh, after school today, we're going to go over to Kilgore, which was where all the alcohol was. Henderson was Dry County, Russ County. You had to go to Kilgore. That was the wet county. So that's, and they didn't check cards. And so we all had to go to Kilgore if you wanted to drink kind of thing. And so, or in their terms, have fun. And so out of it, uh, I'll never forget my friend. He said, hey, Nathan, this is what we're doing. And I was like, all right, well, as the day progressed, I began to hear what all was going to be going on. We were going to go shoot pool. 
Uh, but there was conversation that it was going to be a little bit more, that there was going to be some drinking involved. And so out of it, part of me as a, as a teenager sitting here going, hmm, well, and this is what I begin to say, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with me going hanging? I, I can say no. I'm pretty strong-willed, and thank God he's helped me to say I've never drank before in my life. Praise God. Man, that's part of my testimony. And here's a blessing, man. If that's something you struggle with, I know one who can help set you free from the bondage of alcoholism. Amen? But, but let, me, let me tell you something. Out of that, my friend started saying, hey, we're going. And I was like, man, I just, and so I thought, I'll call my mom and she'll get me out of this. So I called mom. I should have called dad. I called mom. I said, mom, I said, hey, my buddies, I want to go here to this pool hall in Kilgore and shoot pool this afternoon. Uh, what is a Friday night? With this Friday evening, we're going to go out here and do this. What do you think? She goes, oh, Nathan, you know, that, that sounds like fun. Well, I trust you. Whatever you think you need to do. That's not the answer. I want her to bail me out, right? I didn't want to be that guy. And so all of a sudden, I'm sitting here, and I'm like, man. And I get in the car, and I've just made a decision. All right, I'll be able to say no. I know what's going to happen. I think I can go and just have fun, shoot, pull. It'll be innocent. So I get in the car, and we take off. And about maybe a mile from our house or so, there's a Brookshire's. And we pull, and I told him, I said, man, just pull into the parking lot over here. He goes, what's wrong with you? He, I said, man, I just, I don't know if I should go. He goes, your mom already said you can go. Take on, come on, let's go. We're going to have fun. And I was like, that's what I'm concerned about. And he said, no, I'm coming. And I finally just said, hey, listen, just let me out. I'll walk home. He actually was decent enough to take me back and drop me off at home so I didn't have to walk back. But you know what happened to the outcome? Every one of them. It didn't just, wasn't just pull. There was a lot of alcohol involved and even more so afterwards. You know what, I'm so thankful that in that moment, even though I wasn't asking per se, what's the wise thing to do in this? I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit who was giving me those checks. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit was saying, hey, protect the witness. Come on, you need to hear that this morning. Protect the witness. I want you to catch this this morning. Many of us, and parents, I'm going to just talk to you and be pastor for a moment. I want you to hear this. When it comes to our kids, this is what normally what we ask when it comes to asking for wisdom. We ask, what could go wrong? What's wrong with that? And this is the problem is that we put an emphasis on the trust of the ability of our child instead of the emphasis and the ability of the Holy Spirit. People will fail. Come on, now the Holy Spirit will keep. The Holy Spirit will keep. But this is the problem. What on earth is wise with allowing your kids to go to a, par, a, drink, a drunken party thinking that your kid is going to abstain? I have that faith in my daughter, but she will not be going to no party where there's alcohol. Come on. If I know that that's going to happen, she won't be there. Come on. And there's the place of helping to preserve the witness. Because listen, even though we have the spirit, we are still flesh and blood. Come on. And Satan goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's after our kids. He's after us. And instead of being in a position where we ask these questions of, what could be wrong with that? We should be asking, what's the wise thing to do? Because even though we may not stumble, even though we may not falter, it's better to walk in wisdom to preserve life, and to preserve our witness. You want me to tell you a little story of my dad one time? I'll tell you this funny one, I'm going to move on. This was funny. So over in here, we have Choctaw, as, as our casinos. Well, in East Texas, they have the boats over in Louisiana, that, uh, out there in Shreveport, Louisiana. And so, <laughs> bless my dad, right? So out of the, the, this, uh, this happened where my my uncle had invited me. He said, Bill Paul, man, they got good steaks over there. Let's go over to the casino and we can go eat and you don't have to worry about it. It's all separate and everything, right? And everything. Well, little tidbit of information. If you're from Henderson, Texas, and you dare go to the boats, chances are you're going to see somebody from Henderson, Texas, right? My dad's a pastor, a prominent pastor in this community, had been there for a long time. My dad was going, I know I could go and what would be wrong with that? We're going to go in to eat steak and come out, it's not going to be a problem, right? So they take off. Well, just so happened at this particular, they go in to eat and steak in the, the I guess you call it the buffet area. 
Well, they come out and come walking down the steps to go right into the casinos, apparently that was right there, was comes one of the individuals who does business with my dad. And, and out of everybody and God in his glory says, Brother Billy Paul Cain, good Lord, what are you doing here in the casinos over here in Shreveport? Now, was my dad doing anything sinful? Was he doing anything wrong? No. But you know what? In that moment, it potentially could have caused a chink in his witness. Are y'all with me this morning? It's not always in our falling. It's not always in going to the extreme of sin. But what does this witness in this account of our life give account for? Did my dad ever go back to eat steak at the casinos again? Never. He said that was the most humiliating and most embarrassing moment in his life because he knew better. And he allowed somebody to persuade him that what was wrong? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? We're being innocent. But I want to tell you something. It affected him deeply. It grieved him deeply. Now listen, I want to encourage you. I'm not here to point fingers. I'm not, but I want to encourage you. Man, you want to protect your witness. I'm not asking you to. I'm encouraging you as a pastor, as a fellow believer, guard yourself. Don't ask that question, what's wrong with this? But no, live your life above reproach and ask the question, what's the wise thing? What is the, as Paul would say, the profitable thing to do in this matter? Amen? Church, whoa, church, are you with me this morning? Choir, are you all with me this morning? Thank you, amen. Here we go. I want you to look at this. Listen to what he says as far as in this in Proverbs 4, verse 5. Get wisdom. Somebody say, get wisdom. Man, I must have stepped on some toes this morning. I'm going to be getting emails. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her. And she will what? Preserve you. How are you going to keep on living? How are you going to keep on making it through this life? Get some wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Is this the wise thing? Not is it justifiable, but is this the wise thing? Is this the prudent thing? Listen, it'll preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Look to your neighbor and say, above all else, get some wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom and all you're getting Get understanding. Proverbs chapter two talks about the benefits of wisdom. And I'm going to throw these at you real quick. Somebody take a snapshot because I'm going to move fast. Listen, here's the benefits as you read chapter two of Proverbs. There's victory, there's safety and protection. There's understanding, there's knowledge, there's discretion, understanding of right and wrong, and there's guidance and direction. So what do you need in life? Wisdom. And this is what happens as you live your life according to being led by the Holy Spirit and his wise keeping, his wisdom, guess what happens? It preserves your witness. And not by your works, come on somebody, but by the grace of God. Are y'all with me this morning? Third thing and lastly, I want you to catch this as worship team comes or as JC comes, is this is guard your actions. Somebody say guard your actions. I want you to turn back and I want you to see this in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, sorry, chapter 1. Let's pick up in verse 22. And listen to what he says here in, in dealing with this. And he's talking about this as the enduring word of God, that we've received the implanted word of God in our life. And what begins to happen, that there's the, the purging, it's the refining, it's the changing, transform of our life from the inside out. He says, since you have, pur- since you have pur- purified your souls in obeying the truth, who's the truth? Jesus, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. So who have we taken on? Christ, come on, the incorrupt, uh, in- incorruptible. We've taken on Christ, right? And now we're to model Father God. Are you with me this morning? And this is what he says, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all, grass, all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flowers of the grass. He says the grass withers and the flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord, what? Endures forever, endures forever. So where are we gonna get all this wisdom and knowledge? It's the Holy Spirit, but if we wanna know what it looks like, we look at the word of God. We get full of this. Get it into us. Read it. Study it. Listen. Man, listen. Technology has made this easy. 
put it on when you're driving down the road and just listen to it. That's how it comes, how faith comes anyway. Not by reading it, it says by hearing it. Turn it up, listen to it. People pull up and and every other word is something you don't want to hear. Just crank it up. Crank yours up. Let them hear a little bit of Jesus. Amen. This is what happens. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. It's true. Peter says, he says, therefore, lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all evil speaking as newborn babes. Listen, you've got to restart. You're born again. He says, you as newborn babes, all that stuff which you were, the malice, the evil speaking, the envy, all that, all that junk. All of that self-justification, all that stuff has been put aside, has been put to death. You've been made new and alive in Christ Jesus. We're to take on his nature, and we find that through the living word. This is what happens. Lay aside all that. He says this. As newborn babes desire the milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I want to read this out of New Living Translation because I, I, I love the wording of this. It's powerful. I want you to catch this. You put, I don't have it on the screen, do I? Let me pull it up on my phone. I thought I had it in my notes. I want you to see this out of New Living Translation. I do have it. He says, listen, so get rid of all evil behavior. Same verse, chapter 2, verse 1. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babes, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into, listen, the full experience of salvation. How many of you want that? Man, listen, if you've just tasted a little bit of the living God, if you've just experienced just a glimpse of the living God, It was enough to at least draw you to humble yourself, to turn from your sins and say, yes, Jesus, I desire all that you have for me. But we sell ourselves short. He goes, just how deep do you want to go? And here, Peter says, listen, if you want to experience the fullness of the salvation, you don't want to just, you have it, it's in you, but you want the revelation of it? Come on, somebody. It's been freely given to you. It's at hand. It's there for you. But you want to understand it? You want to have the wisdom of it? You want to grow? And man, every day of your life be a new wonder, a new experience to fathom and see the vastness of our God, His kingdom, His love, His mercy, His grace. Listen, He says, this is it. Start as newborn babes and crave Absorb the Word of God. Get it in you so it'll transform your life. It'll renew your mind. So therefore, you begin to take on the nature of the one who saved you and redeemed you. You'll begin to experience really what it means to not only serve the living God, but have the living God living inside of you. Come on. Man, that your life is full. Fill me, God, the fullness thereof, all that you have. This is the reason why I don't understand why people struggle with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I I don't fathom it. I can't understand it. No matter what interpretations, no matter, listen, man, it's all, man, anything God has for me. If he says it's a gift, give it to me because I want to experience the fullness of salvation. I don't want to just make a profession of faith, but man, I want to experience the fullness. What does it mean in my life? Whenever I begin to live, knowing that the living God, not only is He one that I can serve, but man, He's living, He's residing in this vessel. So more so, I want to walk in wisdom. More so, I want to remain humble in my life. More so be at a place of surrender to see his glory, his goodness may manifest that he would be glorified through my life. Latter part of 1 John, I'm gonna close with this. He writes and makes a statement in verse 13 of chapter five. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, 
that you may know that you have what? Eternal life. Listen, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Come on, somebody. Church, I wanna tell you something today. Not only do we serve the living God, but friend, you have the living, if you have surrendered your life to Him, you have said yes to Him, friend, you've got the living God living inside of you. Listen, you can face anything the devil tries to throw at you, but I wanna encourage you, maintain the witness, maintain that which has happened, and stir up the gifts that you may fully experience full salvations, the benefits, the wonder, the marvelous work. Amen.